Hello everyone, today we are going to be talking about using Autodesk robots in the design of composite steel structures, basically those things. Now this is an important step to be covered before we dive into the full design of a steel structure, because if you have a residential structure or a high-rise building designed by steel structures, then you would uh, most probably have the composite slabs being used. So that's one important issue that I need to cover before we dive into steel structures. Of course, if you have warehouses, then you may or may not have those composite steel structures, but who knows? So that's that. Now, unfortunately, Autodesk robot, as amazing as it is, doesn't have any ability to design composite sections in it of itself. However, being an amazing modular software, uh, plugins exist that do further expand its abilities to new heights. So in this video, we are going to provide a quick theoretical discussion on the principles of composite design, followed by a look on how to install the composite design plugin, finalized by using Autodesk Robot to perform a quick design of such composite slabs. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Alright, so although I will try to be as code neutral as possible in this video, there are some points where I have to reference some codes. So please notice that my reference here is a famous book in steel design uh, authored by William T. Segoy, S-E-G-U-I, uh, and my reference here is chapter 9, uh, which is basically going to be right now in the bottom of the screen, inserted by our dear CE editor. Alright, so to start with, Let's understand how those composite structures came to be. What's the history behind that? So the history behind that is it started all as a little idea of um, fireproofing steel by encasing it in concrete. And since steel was encased in concrete, designers thought, well, since I have a concrete encasement, why not take the concrete strength into account, especially for columns? So that was the first initial idea. Now with more improved ways protecting steel against fire, this idea basically died out because, I mean, it became more economical to just use lightweight fireproofing materials and uh, this became obsolete. However, it might still have some applications here, but the usual composite application that you see is basically this one. Now, nevertheless, the idea of concrete with steel is still there especially in steel structures with concrete deck slabs, basically this is concrete now. Notice that, this is very important now, notice, having a concrete deck slab on steel beams doesn't automatically mean you have composite action here. Composite action happens only if you restrain horizontal movement, meaning that you provide means of connecting the concrete with the steel so that they behave as one piece, as one unit. So basically, if no connection between steel beams and concrete is made, so slippage is happening, in that case, your composite action is not achieved, and each part is basically on its own. Now basically, the unified behavior is only possible if slippage is restrained. This is done by the restraining the shear develop between the steel and concrete parts. This is a mechanics of materials and is known as basically VQ over IT in the elastic domain, which is tau here. This tau needs to be resisted by providing uh, resistance, proper resistance. This restraining action is usually done by studs, as you can see here, and also unconventionally by providing C channels, although studs is the most common way of doing that. And those are basically welded on intervals. Studs are usually used for, because of their ease of uh, installation. Also, the flange, if it's wide enough, you can provide two studs instead of just one channel, so it's kind of cool. Practically speaking, and this depends on the region, uh, how do we implement this? How do we erect those composite structures? And this depends from region to region. The skeletal steel structure from columns and beams is erected. Uh, so beams, columns, and connections are done. And this is followed by the installation of studs. So you install your studs on your uh, beams, for example. Then the concrete slab is cast. Now the concrete slab itself cannot just be cast on air. It needs to be shored. And there are two possibilities for this, and we'll talk about this later. You might just provide formwork, like in forms of wooden plates, and to just cast concrete on top of it, or you can provide formwork as a permanent formwork. This is a nice idea, where you would have a perforated steel shell or plate, and you basically put this perforated steel plate on top of the beams, and then you cast concrete inside it, meaning that you will not remove this perforated 
or formed steel deck. And this is basically, it serves twofold here. It serves as formwork, also provides a layer of steel that you can use in design calculations. Notice that we will ignore this as our reference doesn't include this into its calculations. But of course, you feel free to take it into consideration and deal with it. Now, please notice something. In case if you are using ribbed slabs, those are ribs basically now, but of course it's different than the ribbed slab of reinforced concrete. In case you are using ribbed slabs like this, you need to notice that the direction of the rib here is important. Now, usually the ribs, as you can see here, usually the ribs are perpendicular to the carrying column. Uh, to the carrying beam, sorry. And this makes sense because, I mean, if you have a slab like this with beams spanning this direction, well, it makes sense that you will not span your ribs like this because you want the slab to be carried by the beams. So you would span your ribs like this so that the load carried is being carried by the beam. So usually the configuration of your ribs is perpendicular to the carrying beam. Now, just to say that almost all highway bridges that use steel beams are composite, please notice that uh, having composite action means restraint, and having restraint either partially or fully, because yes, we have partial and full composite action. Uh, this, of course, costs money, because you're going to put studs and you're going to weld those studs, but of course, this cost, this extra cost is offset due to the fact that smaller cross-sections may be used uh, to basically achieve better deflection control and design uh, strength. Now, before I continue, I know that the AISC code is designing using the LRFD design principle, which is the load resistance factor design. And uh, it's kind of a design that works on the ultimate limit states, meaning that you are already cracking the concrete and yielding the steel. But elastic analysis is still interesting because, well, it is being used to analyze the deflection, that's one. Two, even the, L the AISC does have provisions for the AS ASD, which is basically allowable stress design. Some people call it the working stress principle. So you could need uh, the elastic theory here. And I want to very quickly talk about this. Now, please notice that once again, I encourage you to check out the reference. But long story short, the elastic theory basically for shear and movement works on composite check sections after you transform the section. Now transforming a section means having one material instead of two. I mean here you have concrete and steel. Now here it's all steel. How do you do this? You could convert the steel into concrete or convert the concrete into steel. Now in the usual cases that you, con you convert the concrete into steel. And this is done by finding the, a modular N here, a modular ratio, which is the elastic modulus ratio. And of course, the concrete will get smaller because steel is more powerful. Remember is that the modular ratio is around 10, meaning that steel is 10 times stronger than concrete, which means that an area of concrete is being 10 times smaller to be accounted for steel. Notice that the width is being made smaller than the thickness because the width is linear in the inertia, whereas the thickness is cubic in the inertia, and things would be totally different here. It's a long story, you know this from mechanics and material courses. All right, so as for the flexural strength here, how would you calculate the flexural strength of such composite materials? Now, please notice that to calculate the flexural strength, you would have to sum up moments around a certain axis, and this would be a flexural strength. Of course, you have uh, steel tensile stresses, and you have concrete compression stresses based on the codes you have, and you can basically sum up those moments around an axis to find the moment. But please notice here, something different. Uh, notice that uh, due to statics, this is compression, this is tension, and we know from statics that compression equals tension. So from all the previous design principles, your compression should equal the tension. But here, there is a limiting factor. Compression should equal tension, should be less than maximum V. What do I mean by maximum V? You see, you might have forgotten, but there are shear studs and connectors between the concrete and the steel. And you cannot develop enough, you cannot develop concrete compressive stresses that are higher than the ability of those shear studs to resist. So now your force, I will call it force, which equals the compression, which equals the tension, is actually the smallest of the following three cases, which is basically area steel F yield. Uh, the compressive block of concrete here, notice that we are using the ACI code here, and summation QN, which is basically the resistance of the shear studs. Um, it's, it's a nice touch you need to get an idea on. Notice here, 
that as for the flexural design, the AISC assumes that, well, as you can see, concrete is crushing, steel is yielding, or studs are breaking. This works only for positive moments only, because under positive moments, your concrete is under compression and will resist. If you are under negative stresses, then this doesn't work because concrete simply doesn't exist. Now, truth to be said, usually our beams are being simply supported between two girders, and once again, this is something I talked about before, this is the responsibility of the designer to, be, to select his connections, to select his, basically, his, uh, his connection between the beams and the carrying girders, because you have your composite uh, slab on top of that beam, so basically, you want to make sure that um, it's positive moment, so that you can actually benefit from the composite action. Because if it's negative moment, then there is no need for any composite action. And you can basically save money by not doing any composite action and not doing any shear studs. The idea of having composite action works perfectly when you have positive moments. So you need to take this into account when you basically plan your structure. And you see, the idea, look, the idea what, what, what makes an engineer really good is not only it's his ability to use softwares, but his ability to understand deep underlying principles that help him get the most economical design possible. Because all engineers could use softwares, most of them will not blunder anything, but it is exactly this that makes you, you know, the special. In our competitive age and day, basically each possible edge that you can get on your, composition, on your opposition is basically a plus point. But of course, here you are at the CE channel, so I hope that I am able to add something to your everyday life. Anyway, with that being said, um, also here note, an important point here, uh, that as per our reference, the lateral torsional buckling of those beams is not an issue because it's if it's composite, it's connected to the slab, which will provide you with lateral continuous uh, support. However, I want to add a caveat here. Uh, I want to say that it should not be a huge difference between the beam size and the slab. I mean, if you have a slab that is very small and a huge beam, then this little slab will not provide anything as for lateral resistance. Now, once again, this is something I mentioned before. I still have not found in the code anything that talks about any limit where you can say if it's bracing or not. So once again, I will leave it to the, like basically the judgment of the engineer. Uh, now, I want once again to mention that this book, there is so many juicy material and detailed drawings here that I really highly recommend to read it. It's really an eye-opener. Now, before I finalize the theory, I want to note that there are two possible construction methods. The first possible construction method is shored, and the other construction method is unshored. Uh, the idea here basically between, or the difference between shored and unshored is the following. If you have a shored construction now, those two words, short and unshored, might really sound cool, but it's simply the difference. The difference between short and unshored is basically who carries the wet concrete. Because when you cast, when you cast your concrete, let's say we cast a simple concrete slab like this. We just cast a concrete slab on top of the erected steel bars. Now, this concrete, when it's being cast, is wet. Now, who carries this concrete? It, it cannot carry itself because it still is wet. It's not settling, it's not setting, nothing is happening here. So it's carrying the weight. Now, there are two options. One is the short option in which you provide some formwork that carries the slab for you. And uh, another option here is unshored, where you rely on your steel beam to carry the concrete slab. Now, notice if you have a short construction, then only one case needs to be considered which is the composite case, basically the final case. So in unshot construction, this is basically when the wet concrete is being carried by the steel beams. Now this means unshot construction, and please note that, if you have an unshot construction, this immediately implies that you have a small little deck, steel deck, below the concrete, because there is no supports here, so this little, uh, this little steel deck will carry the wet concrete and transfer the loads onto the carrying beams. I need to make sure that this deck slab or steel deck is enough to carry the wet concrete. So there are multiple checks here. What is your load path? My load path 
when I have unshot construction is wet concrete goes to steel deck slab, which is very limited in thickness, goes to beam. So this means that the deck slab needs to be able to carry the wet concrete and that the beam needs to be able to carry both wet concrete and the steel deck. Now, you would think that the beam should be perfectly fine, but no, there are little caveats and problems that I want to mention here. Before I mention anything, please notice that this is done during the construction phase, meaning that the loads being applied on the wet slab, which is carried by the steel deck, is not the full dead load and not the full live load, rather than a construction dead load and a construction live load. It's a little bit reduced. The second thing I want to note is very important when talking about the design of beam. Notice I said before that we are, we are assuming that the beam is being laterally braced for the entire length. This is not the case always when you have an unshot construction. In an unshot construction, as long as the concrete is wet and did not basically set, your beam is no longer laterally supported because the concrete is too weak to support it laterally. Only after the concrete gains enough strength is where you can assume it being active and laterally supporting the beams. What I want to say is that the length of bracing or the distance between the bracings is a variable here. I would assume that the length of bracing is the length of span in the initial construction phase and then later, of course, the length of bracing is continuous uh, when the concrete has basically set. And with that being said, you need to double check both cases here. And it's very important that you keep an eye on that. Now, of course, I will leave it for you, but I need to open your eyes here. Uh, so basically, I mean, this should be an indicator enough of how, like, how deep the rabbit hole goes for a, a, for a composite design. Now, all of that was talking about the fluxure strength. What about the shear strength? Here I need to be code unneutral. I want to just say that the AISC code uh, asks the designer to make sure that the shear is being carried by the web only. So it totally disregards anything with regard to the concrete and wants the shear stress to be carried by the web of the uh, section, which is kind of neat. And it's a quick solution for the question as how to talk about the shear stress. To finalize this, of course, you are talking about composite structure, so of course you have to talk about the studs. Now, for the studs, I will leave it for you. You should read the, you should read the reference. The idea being you need to calculate your shear stress from all kinds of calculations that include DQ over IT and are related to MC over I by finding the force of concrete that relates to the shear force being carried by the studs. And if you have the shear force, well, you need multiple things. You need the area steel of the stud, you need the F ultimate of the stud, and you need the spacing of the stud. Now the spacing, the F ultimate is something you find from the catalogs. The spacing depends on the type of slab. If it's a ribbed slab, then the spacing is no longer a variable because your spacing is the distance between the rib center to center. The area steel is what you're trying to find, so, well, you can find the area steel and say, I want so-and-so studs at so-and-so displacement. I think that basically covers everything I wanted to talk about in the theory. And uh, now we are going to check out the robot part. Please note now that I will be focusing on the GUI or GUI usage rather than explanation because I've just done that right now. So, all right, let's open robot because, remember, our video has three parts. Part one is theory. Part two is installation of plugins. And part three is usage of plugins. So let's take a look. Okay, so now I am in Autodesk Robot, of course. I'm in my 3D building design environment, and we want to talk about how to basically install some plugins. So if I go to add-ins, you can see the composite design plugin already installed. However, if you don't have it, and you will not have it, then you can go to Autodesk App Store, and you can open this App Store, and you can take a look. So if you go down, those are possible plugins. This idea statica is something I'll be talking about. This is really amazing for connection design. I kind of like that. There are a lot of toolkits and plugins that you might take a look at. Now, the plugin for today is called Composite Beam Design Extension, and you just basically have to install it. Of course, you might need to sign in in your Autodesk robot, but it's worth the sign in. So you should download that, install that, and once you're done with this, then you would have access to the plugin. So if you click on Add-in and select Composite Design, 
robot will not do anything. It will tell you, hey, it doesn't work because there is no results, which makes sense. So let's give him some results. Now I'm going to make a very simplified structure. My structure is going to have two beams five meters spaced away and two, ge two girders maybe eight meters spaced away. And the z-axis is zero and three. I'll apply that and close. And now I'll just quickly do me a little slab here, a little steel structure. So I'll go to beams. Now, of course, this is a very quick structure, so I will do it rough, roughly. Uh, here, my beam is going to be this, whatever the section is, because I'm just doing something very rough now. now. So I'm just being very quick here. So that's one beam, and that's another, and that's a third. And then I have two girders here. So now those girders should be bigger, but remember, I'm not talking about this now. For the columns, I will basically select this, the same one, and I'll just basically do me some columns here. Of course, as per usual, you know me, I'm going to quickly do me a rundown calculation just to make sure everything is working. Everything seems to be fine. Let's take a look on the results. Yeah, I think everything checks out, so that's fine. Now, of course, that's not enough because I need to add me some loads and some slabs. So I select me a floor, and now I want to be careful. I usually mess it up, so I want to not mess it up this time. I will select me a shell. For the thickness, I will go here, and I will say, well, ribbed slab, basically. And now, I've said before that this Autodesk robot doesn't see the ribs in the design of those concrete slabs, and you don't need to see this. Why? Because when you want to design the ribbed slab, which is this one, uh, the design will not follow the slab system that you saw before in the slab series. I will link it above. The, the design of this concrete block will not follow the slab series because uh, it is not being bent standalone. It's being bent as a part of the composite structure. So do not use the slab GUI here for providing reinforcement. Rather, you should just go here make sure what the concrete compression is, make sure that the concrete can carry the compression and provide minimum reinforcement if you want here. That's my suggestion to you. Of course, it depends from region to region and code to code. Feel free to dis disagree here. Now I'll go in here to my constant. This is not constant. This is nothing actually. I'll just have to select orthotropic now. And well, it talks about the ribs. Now I don't want those ribs. I want slab on trapezoid plate. Notice there is a slab on trapezoid plate, but the plate is not being inputted here. And there is a slab with a trapezoid plate where you input the thickness of the trapezoid plate. Now, it doesn't matter because later you will change this. I will basically select here slab on trapezoid plate. So I'm not providing the thickness here of the slab. Now, of course, there are some inputs here. I will accept the defaults, but if you want to change them, be my guest. You can see each value being provided on the graphic here. Also notice that it's direction X. If you select direction Y, it's different. Then, of course, uh, the direction Y is what will be the ribs. Now, I'll select direction X, and you need to be very careful. Now, remember what I told you. The ribs are... I will add that first. Now, remember what I told you. The ribs are usually perpendicular to the carrying beam. I am planning... For those three beams, this, the, let me just show you, this, this, and this, I'm planning those three beams to be your main carrying beams. Now my ribs are in the X direction. I need to select it here, let me show you. My ribs are in the X direction and they should be perpendicular to the carrying beams. So I need to be very careful when I draw my slab to draw the X axis perpendicular to my three beams. And you remember that. The x-axis is the first line you draw on a, a slab. Now here, I will leave it for you, but you should have multiple dead loads and multiple live loads. For example, you could choose this and modify it by saying, for example, dead load full. I would say here, dead load two, construction. And I'll add me here a live load, which is the full live load. And then I'll also add me a live load, which I will say live load two, construction because this will come relevant very soon i add that close and now start checking my loads in dead load one um what do i have i have my self weight do i have my self weight let me just check no it's not table yes in dead load one i have my self weight now dead load one is the full dead load so i'll apply me a dead load now i will just assume me any load here i'll assume me a 10 kilopascal load in the dead 
this is the full dead load after everything, uh, after the entire structure is being built and basically analyzed. So after the structure is being built and taken into operation. So I'll just add that. Now for dead load two, this is the dead load during construction. Please notice when you calculate dead load one, um, yeah, you have to calculate it on based on the final product. If you select dead load two, this is the dead load you're expecting during construction and this needs to be calculated. In this case, I'll just add me a negative one or five or two. I need, I'm just not calculating. This is on you. You should calculate the dead load in the construction. Notice something very peculiar. If you open loads load table, you can see that the self-width is not only being applied on the first dead load. If you apply a second dead load, the self-width is not included. So what do we do? We include the self-width. So I'll go here to self-width and masses and say self-width for the entire structure. If you go back to loads load table, you will see that the self-width is being included in the second dead load two, which is your construction dead load. Now we go to our live load. In this case, I'll go to surface load. I select me a uniform load. I'll say my live load is four kilonewtons. I'll just add it here. And during my construction, I will assume my live load to be one. Of course, there are codes. It's called actually Manlast in German. So I have my cases. Now I can run the analysis, just double check very quickly. I didn't play with the mesh. Ah, it's not really as smooth as I thought, so maybe I need to make it smaller. So let me just do it very quickly. I'll go to mesh, meshing, select fine, uh, or maybe medium. And run the analysis again, just to make sure that it's a little bit smoother. And you can see, yes, indeed it's smoother. So now if you go to, now we're gonna use the add-in. If you go to add-ins and select composite design, it will not work again, because it will tell you nothing was selected. And if you select the beam, it's kind of mis... Now, don't notice, this is a plugin. So it's not as clear-cut as robot, but it's still okay. So, for example, look, you go to you go to add-in, select composite, tell you no beams were selected. So you go and say, okay, let me select the beam. So select the beam, go to add-ins, composite, it will tell you it doesn't... It does work? Ah, yeah, see? It tells you no slams are found. So it's kind of, you know, you need to be a little bit... Uh, you need to be a little bit... Uh, nice with the software now i'll select the entire slab with the beams and now it will work if you go to add-ins and composite design i mean this should not discourage you oh look i think i messed up see that's why i don't script my robot uh, things now let, let's take a look let me just see add-ins composite the concrete layer was not detected in the slab really why I think something is fishy. Let me just check very quickly. You go to thickness, ribbed slab. Oh, I made a slab out. I made a slab out of steel. That's an oversight. Let me just select concrete again. So I modify this. Wow, I, this is this is this is strange. I was doing a slab of 160 millimeters pure steel. I don't know, but I'm not a millionaire, so fine. Let me just uh, because it costs a lot of money. Okay, so I want to continue. I think I changed it now. Let me just quickly check if you select this now and go to the material. Yes, now it's concrete. So I'll calculate again. No, sorry. I'll calculate again. Now I will go here, select my entire slab with beams. And now go to the add-in and basically send it to the composite design. Let's take a look. Okay, now it's working. Now this is really cool. Now we can select, for example, this. Before you select anything, notice you have on the left side the steps that you need to design. Uh, the deck orientation perpendicular or parallel, you can see that it takes those values from the stuff you input. For example, the 160 was taken from the input of your thickness. Now, I have not inputted any deck thickness, but for now, I'll just input me a 5 millimeter deck thickness because why not? Now, I don't know what the unit is. Yeah, it's 5 millimeter. It tells you 5 millimeter. Concrete density and so on is taken from the software itself. And, well, that's basically everything here. So I go now to cases and combination. This is where things get interesting. Because there is construction dead, construction life, dead, life, material, roof. A lot of things need to take into account. Now, it depends on the code to code, but I think I covered at least those four. So I'll go here to the construction dead and select dead load to construction. I'll go here to construction live and select construction live load. And I'll go here to my dead load, select the dead load one. And go here to my live load and select live load one only. You see he selected both.
because he's assuming that live load one is only an incremental live load. Anyway, I'll just leave it. I'll just accept here as it is. Now for material, I will leave it. Strange, but I'll just leave it. Or you can just delete it, I don't know. You go to loads, you can see uh, the loads that are being applied on the slab, and what the source is. Static calculations, you can see the static calculations of the beam. Notice that there is always an edit and view. And you can see the beam moment diagram and shear force diagram, displacements, moments, shears, and so on. Those are going to be used to design that. Now you can uh, add yourself some Canva if you want or something, but I will not. Okay, so going to displacement, I think it's cool. So you go to extreme results and you take a look. It tells you the extreme results. Notice it is using the 1.2, 1.6 factor because I am using the AISC code. If you have a different code, you need to set it up correctly. Now, there is a help button for the thing that you can check. There is a nice documentation for it. I'll go to, sorry, I go to design and take a look if it works. Now, of course, here I have some problems. Uh, the non-composite strength is bad. The construction deflection is bad. The service deflection is bad, which means that now you could select something different here. But I want to note here that if you select a bigger section, basically your uh, res results here become uh, outdated. So that's not the way to go. I will show, but I'll still do it myself. So I close that very quickly. Is to do. I have. I think I have an idea. I will show you how you can predict the section and then you can imp improve on it. I'll go to design and go to steel member design here and, and follow me with this. This is a nice idea I have for you. Because you see, a steel bar without composite action is weaker than a steel bar with composite action. So I, I will design those steel thingies, so those beams. I'll just make me a new group. And I'll select... You know what? I'll select everything. I'll select all members. And my sections are going to be W shapes. So AISC, W shape, W, everything. I'll save that. Oh, I should use 50 QSI. So A992, for example. A992, there we go. So now that I know the, basically the, the position where I should be looking at, I'll go now to my W shape, select my big W shape this time. You know, something of, of the 18 parts. I'll just go to 18, for example, here. You know, something big. I'm being wasteful, I know. This needs multiple iterations, but my you know, point here is to show you the idea. I'll add that, close, and now I'll change everything to the section. So I'll select section, select my new section, click all here. I should not have done that because it's different uh, groups, but I just want it to be a little bit savvy. So you can see it's become bigger. So now I run the analysis, and that's what I meant by running the analysis because the results will change now depending on the cross sections because you don't have an in, because you have an indeterminate structure. So now selecting this, going to add-ins, composite design. Now I will basically does it run the analysis automatically? Really? Let's go to design. No, it does. Great. Geometry is inputted. I didn't input the deck thickness. Okay, I will just ignore it for now. You know what I mean. Oh wait, my cases are incorrect. So okay, let me just select my cases here. Construction live. Now this becomes a tedious. Uh, wait, I messed up. This becomes a tedious task where you need to keep iterating until you get it right. But of course, I will not do that. Dead load, and here you have only live load one. I don't think it will work. Static calculations, extreme results, design 1.14. We are getting closer. Now, of course, it can design composite and non composite. Uh, the non-composite non strength is not enough. What does it mean the non-composite strength is not enough? I think you know where I'm going. If you click on composites, so you're assuming that there's a composite action now, you can see that because if you remove composite, then the beam will not work. If you select composite, then the beam will basically have a composite action. And you can see that the number of starts gets for you assumed. Of course, you can make it smaller or larger. Um, the eventual failure mode is start failure, meaning that this is what controlled the design, but regardless, you have a ratio of 1. Meaning if you make 23, 
they have a ratio of 1.05 so 24 is the, mi the minimum amount of studs you need if you want to enable the composite design action of course you can design the selected beam or select design all beams i'll just keep it for the selected beam right now and uh, to finalize you want to see a report notice that we are using only the selected beam you can design all beams if you want of course composite action design but maybe in the previous one i didn't select composite so okay that might be a bummer no problem if you go to reports you can see all the things you can report here you can select everything if you want because why not i mean it, it's it's him who is gonna suffer not me you click on report and autodesk robot provides you an amazing report showing you the studs position and this is really juicy i am in love with this i don't know about you but i'm in love so you can see the full composite design with all those things with all the uh, successes here let's take a look the stud capacity is what controlled the design uh, it's kind of nice and yeah that's basically everything i guess i think i'm happy with this and you can basically export this by saying file uh, export in excel or word wow excel is amazing so basically this is how you design composite sections in autodesk robot and it's not all it's not only remember we are not only talking about the design as in using robots. We are talking about uh, the theory first and then talking about the analysis using the robot. Now, this opens Pandora's box for you. Dive deep into this. There is a lot of options that you might think interesting. My point is only to cover the basics here because you might need that in the future when we talk about steel structures. So anyway... I hope that you enjoyed the video and that it was beneficial for you. Of course, if you have enjoyed the video, then please like, share, comment and subscribe, especially subscribing because it helps increase the reach of my channel. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel and we will catch you in the next video.